So I was an aspiring engineer and I went on to pursue that in full throttle. And I was a very traditional Indian girl who was so shy that I would not come out of from behind the curtains to see strangers. I was a very shy girl and very traditional. From then on, I decided that I want to do something different because right from my childhood, I'm a person who is questioning the status quo but not fitting the bill of a traditional girl. So I thought I'll take something challenging and I moved on to become a chartered accountant. And then very soon I landed in um, US and then I was a CFO. From then on, I went on to play the roles of international tax advisor. And as I changed countries, I was a certified public accountant. I was a business advisor. But throughout this journey, the common thread is I identified myself as a spiritual seeker because I come from a religious background where rituals are a given and you, they induce a lot of fear in the name of God and processes. So I found myself questioning that religion and I thought spirituality is the high end. So, and my family is into spirituality. So I pursued spirituality as a seeker, but then I realized that is also seeking personal significance in the name of spiritual seeking. From then on, I thought, and people were saying, oh, you're good with people, you're good with minds, you're working with teams, and you're able to give that results. But I'm not a task-oriented person alone. I was a people-oriented person. And when they was talking about it, I thought maybe there's something there, let me go and explore. And I've become a life and business coach. So these are all my past identities. This is not me today. That was my identity. I was an independent woman. And when do you want to be an independent woman? Only when you are not. And after that identity, I was a wife and a peacekeeper because I want to get married to a big family because I lost my mom when I was two and I had to escape from abuse myself. And there were other traumatic incidents in my life. So I was seeking stability in the name of the standard template of marriage, children, family and relationships. So anyway, so that was my past identity. But why am I sharing this with you? It is not to introduce, give you a life story about me. That transition helped me to understand you will change your identities with your evolution and it is okay. If I stood and remained as a traditional Indian girl, perhaps I wouldn't have taken any other identities. But these identities also taught me the power of mind body and energy but i didn't start with body and energy i started with the power of mind because that's supposed to be the highest thing you can achieve by focusing on mind but my journey taught me otherwise and that's why i am not any of them anymore and this is me today i'm a healer thought leader and a philosopher now have you ever experienced trauma Have you seen trauma? You, you do know what is trauma. Have you ever experienced trauma? Anyone? You've experienced trauma. All right. Hmm. Sorry, what's happening with us? Oh, right, okay. So I'll introduce you to the ego hamster wheel today, which Brenda will easily recognize. And so if you experience trauma, please do stay with me in this conversation. And as I said, we will keep the knowledge and who what we did in the past. We will keep it aside for the next few minutes and we will start discussing. Now, this is the ego hamster wheel, which is absolutely uh, my concept and my structure behind healing a trauma. And if you understand this structure, you can pretty much understand how someone is holding on to these traumatic memories. And trauma is not just, and this entire process is just not confined to trauma because if it is anxiety or depression or jealousies or grief or possessiveness, if you can understand this basic structure, which is quite deep, you can totally let go quite a few things. However, before jumping into the ego hamster wheel, let us talk about why, when I'm saying it is so simple, it is really simple to understand this. It is really possible to uh, let uh, release trauma for someone in one or two sessions. It's very much possible. And if, I, if they're really complex traumas, I take about maximum six sessions, which we will see a testimonial in the, uh, in the next few slides. So that's what it is. So people, instead of spending 
20 years, 30 years, and they're saying, I did a lot of work. I worked a lot on myself. I understood so many things. And still, why are they failing to give those results? There are healers out there. There are therapists. Everybody is studying. Everybody is having skill set and modalities. But why are they failing? The reasons, these are the basic challenges. One, number one is fear. Can anyone think and or guess what are you really scared of? What do you fear the most? Any guesses here? You want to give in a chat box? Any guesses? What do you fear the most? Failure. Failure. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other guesses? What do you fear the most? Going through the pain again. Capabilities, uncertainty, staying stuck, leaving the comfort zone. Any one last thing? One more last one? Rejection. All right. Thank you. So what you fear the most is facing yourself. It's not the failure. It's not rejection. It's not any of those things. What you really fear is facing yourself. And if coaches, therapists, if they're failing to give the results to someone, that is because they are afraid to face themselves. They're afraid to understand how this mind is working and how they can overcome that. Because they cannot face that fear, and the depth to which you can understand yourself is the depth to which you can see yourself. Sorry, I think I phrased it wrong. The depth to which you can see others is the depth to which you can understand and see yourself clearly as it is. So if I show you, say, this one, if you are not using your knowledge, this is just a block, a purple block, isn't it? Or something in these dimensions. But only when you apply the knowledge, you can think it is a mobile or it's a purple color, mm -hmm. even that becomes your knowledge. So the fear is primarily coming from that knowledge of not losing something, not wanting to lose something. So number one, that role, that uh, number one thing that plays a major role in coaches' lives or therapists' lives is the fear to face themselves, nothing else. It's the fear to see themselves truly and honestly. The second one is about mindset issues. So this is something so overbeaten, mindset, mindset, mindset. And I don't stand for mindset because can anyone say why? Why I think mindset is not an issue at all? Anyone? Any guesses? If you can put in the chat box. Okay, so while you're thinking, the reason why mindset is not an issue at all is because if you fundamentally understand the reality or the how this is really working the mindset is just an outcome of that so what's the point in trying to fix a pipe that is leaking by putting band-aids a pipe that is strong is strong but however what happens is most of the times as a matter of resilience or as teaching mindfulness you're focusing on mindset and you're saying use affirmations or do your journals or say something to yourself that is a coping mechanism that is something a tool that will temporarily help you but the reason why we are failing is because we are starting point for any of the coaches and therapists is coming from mindset but we are failing to understand we are much more than that the third one is about filters this filters plays a very major role because as coaches and therapists, or at least in my um, instance, I work with both perpetrators, abusers, and victims simultaneously. But if you didn't resolve your experience, and if you're having a strong definition of what is good, what is bad, if you're having a strong definition of what is right, what is wrong, how can we facilitate someone? To process their emotions. If you have this strong need in you 
to prove yourself. If you have the strong need in you to define yourself with those values and identity, what you mentioned at the, right at the beginning, how can you see someone without your filters? So the key to really facilitate that for someone is not by holding space for them, is not by listening to them. It is by being. It is by walking the talk. So what you are ready to preach, teach, advise, counsel, listen, you should be that in the first place. So, and if you can become a very clean mirror, then you are facilitating them to see themselves in you. Are you with me when I said this? Yeah, so anyone, if it is too much, you have to give me a thumbs down and I will explain a little further. Yeah, yes, Joanne. Ah, okay, so we'll talk about it a little further. All right, okay. So the filters are, say, I can, I can give you a situation. Recently, I had to talk to a client and the client came to me for absolutely a different reason saying she's stuck in her life. And when it is someone is stuck in their life, you come, you go with a different mindset, not necessarily uh, in the mode of uh, trauma healing. It's more about just understanding why they are stuck. But in the process, what happens is the role I play most of the times is a person to whom people confess. I play the role of a priest many a times. And I had to play that role because she confessed that she abused her grandchild. If you have the right and wrong definition, how will you help that lady? If you are very strong with good and bad, how will you facilitate process of healing for this person? So can you see, we have to travel way beyond the social concepts and social structures in order to give that facility, in order to facilitate that for someone. Are you with me, Joanne? So it's important for us to see that, to understand that. What if a dad who abused his child is coming to you and saying, I did this and that is killing me, that's my guilt. How would you talk to them? How would you approach them? If you have very strong definitions of right and wrong and what if that becomes, that is your trigger because you are abused as a child. So can you see why it is so important to work on ourselves and resolve that fundamentally to be able to facilitate that for someone? So those are the filters. So what if you are gripped by empathy? What if you're gripped with integrity? Will you have value judgments of people who come to you? So can you see we should be devoid of Yes, there are values, but also at the same time, we have to play the role of not seeing those values, good and bad, right and wrong, and seeing it as it is, as if there is no past, no future, the present, that's all is available. So that's the filters. Now, the fifth one, the fourth one is the skill set. Skill sets are, we all have different skill sets, and I too did various skill sets, but skill sets and modality is not the key. You are the key. You can learn n number of techniques, n number of modalities. I did quite a few techniques and quite a few modalities, including hypnosis and other stuff, but it is not the skill set. But however, what happens is if you're too uh, engrossed in qualifications because you yourself are feeling inadequate, or if you think you're not good enough, or you're having the issues of being not worthy, so you will equate knowledge, qualifications to knowledge. And if you don't have that, you will not be able to give the result to them in spite of the fact you are really capable. Can you see how your own definitions and decisions and conditioning is playing, is detrimental to your own growth? Can you, is everybody with me when I'm saying this? How our decisions are detrimental to our growth? So these are the main four challenges with many coaches and therapists I see that they're stuck in one of these and they cannot give the results. Now, so I'm going to share here one testimonial, as I said, a complex uh, trauma 
with 23 years to 30 years uh, of traumatic uh, memories and we can give results but also what i want you to do before we dive into the ego hamster wheel and we will take this as an example and we will work with it just listen to the story and observe the language observe the body language and how the transition is happening because trauma is not bad all the times though the experience is a bad experience my name is Dean Holland. Can everyone I'm listen to the audio? I'm a detective chief inspector with Surrey Police, having served Thank 26 you. and a half years. I attended a few online meetings with, with Lana um, at the various workshops that she did, and a lot of what she said really, really resonated with me um, in terms of my, my PTSD. I actually went, it was um, 10 years undiagnosed with PTSD. Um, and when it was acknowledged, I started going through various therapies. Um, I got I got to the point where there was so much going on in my head. I didn't know I had PTSD. Um, my force medical officer made a note in my file that I had PTSD, but he hadn't shared that with me. So I went through a 10 year period where things were happening to me internally, which I, I, I kind of looked at as being normal. Um, that my family were recognising that there were problems and difficulties with me. Um, and I played on my parents. All I was really concerned with was I wanted to do the best I possibly could in my career and I didn't want anything to stop me. So I developed some really, really unhealthy coping mechanisms which my supervisors didn't pick up on. I was a constable at the time. Um, so that was back in 1992. I was, I was still young in my service. I'd only had a couple of years in service. Um, and I got to the point where I just woke up one morning and said enough's enough, I, I, I can't do this anymore, there was just so much going on in my head that I couldn't process and I couldn't share with anybody, I, I didn't understand it and um, I sat, I always remember it, it was, it was a, a wet, wet Friday morning and I sat down, I, I was on an early shift, so I sat down, I was having a cup of tea at about 5 o'clock in the morning there's only one in the house and I thought this is it, I can't do this anymore. Today's the day, I'm, I'm going to end it all today. And I sat there working out how I was going to do it, what that looked like. And I remember looking out into the garden and it was horrible and it was wet and it was cold and I sat there and I just kept going processing what I was going to do, what I was going to do, what I was going to do. And I fell asleep. Um, and I'd only not long gone up, so I fell asleep. And when I woke up, it was about one o'clock in the afternoon. And it was a bright sunny afternoon. And I don't know what possessed me, but I just phoned, picked the phone up, phoned my occupational health team up and said, well, I just cried down the phone. I just, I said, I need help. I need, if I don't get help now, I'm going to do something I really know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to take my own life. Um, and that was really the start of that particular journey. But it was only the start because at that point I got, I got, what they felt was the most appropriate treatment. So they, they sent me, I was seeing a psychiatrist, I had various psychologists that I've seen. I probably went through three psychologists, all trying to piece together what was wrong with me. Um, and none of them linked it back to the fact that I'd experienced this life-threatening experience whilst on duty. Um, and I had a period off of work, six months, came back to work, life duties, the usual sort of police procedural things to do. And I picked up my career, um, I rebadged myself, and I, I ploughed on again. It wasn't another five years passed before I was back in that situation again. And I broke down again. And I went through more psychologists, two more psychologists at that point, um, and various other sort of therapies that they wanted me to have a look at, and none of it worked. It was like going through the motions. And I'd come away from it thinking, oh, it must just be me, I must just be broken that much that none of their techniques, none of their, none of the interventions that they're putting in place are going to work for me because I'm just broken. And that's my life. And I've got to deal with that. Um, and there was lots more going on domestically for me. It was having a huge impact on, on a number of relationships that I had at the time with my wife and my family. So I carried on in service. That would have been a 15-year period. So I carried on carrying this trauma, carrying this because I had various facets of PTSD, it wasn't just one thing, it was, it was three or four different strands of, of PTSD, the not sleeping, the night terrors, sudden startle syndrome, um, 
I just carried on living with it. I know this is sound develop these really bad coping mechanisms. Um, and one of those was just to throw myself into work. So people said, well done, I was getting promoted up through the ranks. I was doing degrees, I was doing promotion exams, all sorts of things. And people pat me on the back and said, well done. But what they didn't understand was that it was my PCC that was driving me. So I didn't have to think about it. I was, I was putting all my effort and attention into something else just, just to alleviate the, the difficulties I was going through. So fast forward, uh, I retired 26 and a half years service, not because of my PTSD, but because I had formed military service and I transferred my pension across. So uh, I retired with a full pension, no problems at all. And then six years later, I came across, as I say, Mama in a couple of workshops. And I thought, she just had this incredible way about her. And I, I, I just connected. I barely, barely said a few words to her, and I, and I connected, and I thought, what she says makes a lot of sense, and she unpacked it in such a way that I, I could understand it, and I could visualise it, and I was listening to these stories and the case studies that she'd been doing. I think it's incredible, but it, it, it was very similar to the things I've heard previously from other people who suffered from PTSD. I thought, well, what's the difference? What, what, what's Mana capable of doing? That all these psychologists and other people that I've been to see, and all the medication that I had to take, didn't resolve any of my issues. So what was it? So I become curious. So I reached out to Mark and said, look, I wonder if we can have a chat. And we had a couple of chats and she said, I can help you. And I'm like, okay, that, that's good. That's what I want. And she said, oh, and that, this is what I special. And she explained to me what she did. She went through things. Um, and I, I started having some sessions with Mark now. And the very first session we had, it was so powerful. It was incredible. Um, she asked me questions in, in a way that I've never been asked questions before, um, in a very safe and environment, in a very trusting way. Um, and I just opened up to her in a way that I wasn't able to open up to anybody else before over the last best part of just over 30 years. Um, and it was just incredible. And we would tackle the various issues that I was experiencing within my, my issues with PTSD. And one by one, over, over a period of two or three weeks, two or three sessions, I should say, we, we just eliminated them. And it was incredible. They were there, but then they don't have, they had a real powerful impact on me. I mean, if I hear a siren going off, it would take me right back to that moment where I was in trouble. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. When I see the images that I've seen before, I have no emotion attached to them. They're there, and that's it. They're, and they're fleeting, and I know I move them on. Whereas in the past, they were just there constantly, despite, as I say, the help that I've, I've been given previously. It's just, it's just incredible. Mark, she's just got this way that she'll take you, but you might not want to go, but you'll, you, you'll go. I went, and, it, and it's just incredible. It was just a really powerful experience and, and it's very emotional. It's, it's very, um, sometimes it can be quite draining physically, but in the, in the hours and, and days and weeks afterwards, the, the feeling of elation, the feeling of just being that weight lifted off of your shoulder. You know, and I'm not held, I'm not held um, captive or slave to those emotions and feelings that I was experiencing. It's just incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm a much happier person, I'm a much more contented person. Um, my family have seen an incredibly different side of me. I'm more relaxed. Um, I'm definitely less, less stressed than I was before. Um, and I just feel I, feel I can live a fuller life now. Because beforehand, as I say, I was haunted by PTSD and I, and I felt there was, no, there was no cure for me. But now, I can do the things that I want to do, knowing that I'm not going to hit that wall. It's not going to bring me down in the future. Yeah, I'll remember it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, it will happen. It's there. I can't get rid of it completely, but it doesn't affect me anymore. It means nothing to me. It's just one of those, it happened to me in life. It's one of the experiences, as much as a really good, positive experience was. Um, so yeah, I, it's just freed me to enjoy the rest, the rest of my life. Mana is an incredible empathic, intuitive person who really understands how the human mind works. She really understands the physiology, people's, people's emotions, people's bodies. And she can help. If you've got 
any problem, mine happens to be a very traumatic experience. If you've got any problem, mine can help you with that. I just I get excited with thinking that people who were suffering like I was suffering could actually be as happy as I am. She's incredible. She's got a, a talent, the X Factor. That's what she's got. She has got X Factor. So that's Dean and if you really knew Dean's story, it was cathartic. Sorry, I can just see some messages coming in. Circumstances, characteristics and capacity. All right, thank you. All right, I'll come back to your chat, chats uh, in a while. So the things that you have to understand with Dean is trauma as much as it is an unpleasant experience at that time. It, it is also your best friend in many ways because there is wisdom in it and that drives you, that drives you to become successful, that drives you to achieve whatever you want to achieve and for some it is also very debilitating because it will not allow you to take step forward. So when in, in sessions when we are working with someone, even the thought of taking one step forward, they fear that. And that's how this trauma can be very debilitating or can help you to move forward. And when we are, when Dean was talking about his experiences, it's you, you cannot imagine being on the deathbed, being almost close to the murder and coming back to life. And those memories, that's what he's talking about. But why this is important that I'm sharing again, I'm repeating, it is the possibility of, able, of being able to give that result to someone. And it is very much possible. And if it is possible for me, it is possible for you too, if you understand the ego hamster wheel that we are going to talk about in a while. Now, the three keys to remember to give these results to someone. Number one, you don't heal trauma. It's a myth if you ever think you're healing trauma because as I say, you're not helping anybody but yourself. And every person who is coming to see you or with a trauma or a help the truth is you're helping yourself because they are the mirrors for you to see yourself. And in the process, you start cleaning up your mirror and you become a mirror for them. So why that is important? Because people take years and years and decades and decades to uh, work on this trauma and they have been working, they have been through therapies. But the thing, the reason why they are not able to work with is because as I said right at the start, it's about being. It's not the skill, it's not the modality, it's not the technique. It's about you being. If you take away that factor of you from who, what you're doing, then you're not really facilitating a change for anybody. So number one, you don't heal trauma. Nobody is broken to be fixed. It's a trauma. And as Dean said, a positive, it's just like any other positive experience, it is a memory. It is there, but there is no emotion to it. Number two, post-traumatic stress is not an injury, wound, disorder, or a disease to heal or resolve. However, as I said right at the start, because you relive that memory and you add layers and layers to it, what if that has happened? What if this could have happened? What if that happened and that led to that? What if I'm not with uh, my loved ones? What if I died here? What if, what if? So the memory, your fears as ongoing fears becomes added to that memory and that memory becomes a loop that you don't want to let it go. And after a point that becomes your best friend to stop you from doing anything. So have you ever experienced any point of time in your life that you do certain things, but you clearly know it's not good for you? Anybody here? Candid enough, thank you. So can you see how our own mind, how we are conflicting with ourselves? And we don't know, and these traumatic memories can be very subconscious that you don't even know you're doing that. So it's not an injury, wound, disorder, or a disease to heal or resolve. That's the kind of key too you have to remember. And the third, it's a memory like any other experience. But 
as we now going to ego hamster wheel we'll understand how we help others create memories so now you are looking at me and you will be seeing some data behind me which is not conscious and i am planting a memory in your brain right now so what happens is this memory is just like any other experience however if you have the filters of good and bad right and wrong you will not be able to see that just as a memory you will add your perception to it and your understanding to it so that's key three that we have to remember now the three common myths why coaches fail to give the results because change is a slow process how many of you heard over here it can be resolved in one go it will take its time it's a journey how many of you heard this statement in your life at least once have you heard that so can you see that it that in itself can be your limiting decision because we constantly right at the start i said keep your knowledge away i know it is not possible but still we take it on and we buy it and we own it we own it to the point that we start repeating it and becomes our reality so you defy the reality with your decision because you believe change cannot happen one go but change can happen just like this then the second brain is the control center if you are driven by the need to prove yourself if you are driven by the thought that knowledge equals qualification you can go on and research about how brain functions what chemicals it is producing how it is acting what are the brain waves alpha theta waves you can talk about all these things but the truth is brain is not the control center brain is a reactor are you with me when i said this brain is a reactor it's not the control center third everything begins with mindset wrong mindset is the outcome mindset is the understanding the sum of your decisions some of your beliefs and then comes the mindset so what's the point in pushing a fish to climb a tree so it is about understanding the inherent nature of fish it's about understanding the inherent nature of an animal or a human and then working with them so if we can if we are so focused on these things if your belief change is a slow process then you will take years and years to resolve even if your therapist or healer is ready to resolve if you believe brain is the control center you can spend your entire life reading and researching and understanding and forgetting the basic structure so now what are the four behavioral categories that you will commonly experience when someone experience trauma rational rational is where someone can become very logical they decide that everything they analyze and they take a decision however what we experience or we think is we're disconnected from their emotions or we think they are very logical and they they are not connected to themselves or to their energy or to their body but the truth is that moment in that traumatic incident they took a decision i'll be very rational and dean went on to climb up the career ladder because he took a very rational decision that i will perform and i will achieve as his coping mechanism so he is a successful man very knowledgeable very much logical everything he did is very rational so that is one way of how people decide to behave and to lead a life and that's where they rely on information they rely on evidence they rely on knowledge they rely on analytics the second is an irrational behavior where people cannot control their anger or tempers or food uh, misuse of food or addiction so they can become irrational behaviors or self harm and this does not happen knowingly this happens without their knowledge too which is very subtle the third is voluntary voluntary is where you can see many rescuers out there who went goes out to help people always there to help people volunteering their time to take someone off their problems and common thing that you will hear when someone is really in volunt in that voluntary mode is you will hear that i can feel their pain and i feel nauseatic in my stomach i am an empath so i feel it in my body 
So what they're saying, because of the things that they experienced in the past, they decided that they had to be that kind and empathetic towards others, that they forget the boundaries and they take it on onto themselves. And they wear that badge so proudly that they're an empath. The fourth one is about involuntary behavior where after a few days you will realize, how did I end up here? Why are these people all asking me to do these things? You won't even know. And then all of a sudden it becomes your responsibility and you wear this badge of responsible person and you want to lead it and you know within you that that's not what you wanted. So can you see how these four behavioral categories, you cannot exclude one from the other. And sometimes we take on these four behaviors without our knowledge on our day-to-day -day lives. And we can become unpredictable because your parents or your partner or your kids can say, you did that there, but why are you deciding differently here? Potential conflict. But the truth is, that's how your uh, mind and that's how you took the decision to react to situations. And we normally think PTSD comes from one specific incident. It's not because, as I said, memory is an overlapped memory of all your experiences. So it stems from various situations in your life. And what can trigger a traumatic experience does not have to be another trauma. So if you experience trauma and if you are stuck in a personal significance of me, why did this happen to me? What, did, what wrong did I do in my life? I didn't harm anybody. And if you're holding on to your personal significance and ego and a stranger passing by who does not even know you, say something that can trigger you and you will be in this traumatic state again. So it's not how the trauma does not add to trauma. If you're not resolving it, anything, a neighbor saying something to their family can trigger you. And so you start attracting that. So these are the four behavioral categories you will notice when someone is experiencing trauma. And when I say here trauma, I want to be very mindful that it's just not trauma because anxiety stems from trauma. Depression stems from trauma. But however, we made trauma such a big uh, thing that you cannot, a monster that you cannot resolve. However, it is stemming from one of these and that trauma is not necessarily your lifetime trauma. It is where we talk about epigenetics and we talk about genetic instructions where you carry those memories. Now, what is this EMPR method? And I say this is not a talking therapy because I do take 45 minutes uh, sessions where I try to understand what is happening in their lives and what happened in their life. But it's not about the details. It's about understanding how that mind decided to function, how that person took those decisions and made those choices, what led to that. So to understand the pattern and on the clock, I identify a core pattern in seven minutes. And in seven minutes, you will be able to say this is blocking a person. And the moment you're hitting on the root cause in seven minutes, you will release that emotion in that same session. But what takes time for many people to understand is that seven minutes can be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years for many. And if you can just understand that, then resolving it is the easiest part. Identifying it is the hardest part because we all process things differently. All right. So this is not a talking therapy and the framework behind the EMPR method is 27 dimensions of being, which is again my concept of understanding how this mind is functioning and how they're making meaning out of it. And if you see on the right side, I said it's becoming being and unbecoming because unless you understand how you have become who you are, keeping those knowledge filters, keeping the spirituality, keeping that empathy, keeping that kindness aside. And unless you make the decision to see it for what it is, without your filters and without your uh, definitions and meanings, you will be able to see how you have become, you have become who you are. It's not never about the other person who experienced trauma. And again, I repeat, it's you. How did you become who you are? And, and you should be able to see it as it is. And once you understand that, the next phase is about understanding being because there's a reason why I wear my hair like this. There's a reason why you style your hair that way. 
there's a reason why you purse your lips there's a reason why you tilt your head this way there's a reason and those reasons in those core patterns you identify the blocks that being is talking to you constantly so if i spend that time with you you are constantly talking to me it's just that we are not understanding the language of being and we are too focused on the language of speaking we are too focused on that language so if you can understand the language of being people are constantly talking to you that's the key that's the reason why i spend enough time in this empr method for you to understand the becoming and being and once you understand yourself how you have become who you are and how you are being and if you can flip it and unbecome as ramdas says becoming nobody you have to go to that point of flipping it and again you will become somebody so this is not a one step or three steps journey to becoming being and unbecoming that's a continuous process and that's where i said right at the start these were my identities but if i don't let go of the first identity i will not see the next however most of us we want to keep hold on to that identity for a lifetime as a mother as a wife as a woman so i question even the women and men in the masculine gender feminine gender because you should be able to see beyond a man and a woman to understand and work with these emotions so that's the three frameworks of becoming being and unbecoming that we delve into in the empr method and by understanding that you are understanding yourself and only by understanding yourself you are becoming a clean mirror that anybody can see themselves otherwise you are giving a meaning to them now this is something really i found it interesting that when i'm working people say oh no you can't do that how can you claim it how is it possible but the truth is 90 seconds is all it takes to identify an emotion and dissipate while you simply notice it that's a research well done research however as i said it's not in resolving it's in identifying so it's not in resolving an emotion it is in identifying that's the key which is the 27 dimensions of being and if you also understand the research that is being done in epigenetics and genetic instructions changing your perception changes your dna and that's where i correlate to the point i said your brain does is not the control center brain is a reactor because if you can change the perception by identifying and helping them to release or resolve you are changing the dna so then comes the question most of the people who experience trauma believes this is their life they can't move from it but the truth is you and i can at least spread this possibility this message that by changing your perception you're changing your dna you're changing diseases you're changing your genes you're changing your future so people get stuck in tarot people get stuck in astrology people get stuck in spirituality thinking they are defining the destiny but the truth is as you pour some water from a high level to the low level plane it is very natural for the water to flow down don't you agree with that water will naturally flow down but with your intention if you can create a conduit it will not flow down do you agree so you have both the abilities if you don't do anything water will naturally flow down and if you want to do something you can change that equation and you can change the direction of the water so that's changing your perception changes your dna because we can help people who are afflicted with severe traumas to make the changes in their lives and that shifts happen instantly all right so now moving on to the ego hamster wheel here i want us to be totally open and see it for what it is without our filters so what we are talking about here is the universal consciousness so again here i'm not going spiritual i'm not talking about taking the words that people are using about universal consciousness and individual consciousness because i played the game of a spiritual seeker that's just a game of the mind and once you cross that identity you will see beyond that you will understand beyond that but what happens is because people are not able to resolve their issues on a base level they're trying to jump right to the cliff and taking it on oneness and consciousness but the truth is that the, the, what do you say the devil is in the details 
So the devil is really in the details. But what happens is if, because you cannot operate at this level, people are going to this high end. But what's happening is while trying to project the picture, they're forgetting to deal with the things that happen in between. So universal consciousness, if you now think, if keeping the spirituality hat away, keeping the religious hat away, keeping the knowledge and analytical hats away, if you are truly understanding universal consciousness, it's just the inherent intelligence available to you and me in the universe, in the nature. Like a seed knows how to germinate. You don't have to teach the seed. That's simply put universal consciousness. From that inherent knowledge of the seed knows how to germinate, that seed be in Australia, seed be in India, seed be in UK, seed be in New Zealand, that seed knows how to germinate. In that context, it is oneness. Do you agree? That is oneness. So we don't have to dig into that oneness deeper than that. That's oneness and that's a similarity. However, whether the seed germinates or not really does not matter to the seed. Do you agree with this? However, we create a lot of personal significance to ourselves and we attach to the thought that it, we should germinate. Change should happen. However, so you, that is universal consciousness. Now from universal consciousness, if we are stepping now, I want you to think about yourself. Sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my screen so I can just see. Thank you. So from that universal consciousness, what's happening is imagine now you stepping out of that universal consciousness and you're creating this individual consciousness. As a child, as a baby, you're stepping out. It's almost like taking a bottle of water from the ocean and you're creating this individual consciousness which has every element of the ocean in it. So you are part of universal consciousness. Are you with me? And then you can decide to change this bottle of water from the ocean. You can color it, you can change the taste, you can desalinate it, you can do anything you want because that is the choice you have. So that individual consciousness also comes with this inherent intellect to germinate, inherent intelligence. With that inherent intelligence, what's happening is you're experiencing things. So just in these four things we are discussing between universal consciousness and individual consciousness, you are carrying the biomemory. The biomemory of cells, the biomemory of your parents. But it is not necessarily your parents' experiential memory. It is as simple as one of your great grandfathers heard his friend talking about something can be part of the memory data bank and you can get that memory here. So can you see the memories you carry are not necessarily your memories. So here I'm going very contradicting and I'm saying people get stuck in past lives and they say this is my past life but can you now see this is not your past life this is your ancestral this is your great grandfather this is your mother father or some distant uncle or no relation at all a news in the newspaper that your great grandfather was reading out so it is not your memory can you see now straight away people afflicted with trauma they get stuck thinking why me what did i do because of my past life it's not your past life it's a memory that you received and you can change it so that's a little bit of we go into detail in the program but that's a little bit of understanding about just those four lines and with that that bottle water can have an experience and you can change it to salt or sweet or colors or purples. And at the point of experience, you can be observing, but you fail to observe because we are too engrossed in this I. I should be successful. I should be doing this because we are conditioned that way. And from those experiences, what happens is you process them through your five senses and your mind, which is your five representational systems, your five senses, and mind is your internal sense. So is everybody okay when I said mind is your sense or is mind bigger than anything else for you? Mind is your sense. I agree. Thank you. So there's some two chats in there. I'm just seeing Naveen going. Uh, thank you. All right. Now, 
So through after these senses, so when you are experiencing, can you see now, even before forming any emotions or anything, it's your body that is taking things in. You're seeing, you're hearing, you're listening, you're touching, you're feeling. So this is all your body. It's happening right in your body, even before it becoming something. So when you experience that through your body and that body is making a meaning through your mind and it is giving a meaning to you, that's where we again get carried away by soul. We didn't see soul. We are projecting a concept of a soul onto something. But the truth is that spiritual body is in you because you are the carrier of those memories. That's the soul. The memory tank is the soul and your body is only holding it. So you're adding and lay, adding layers to that memories in your body. So when you're doing that, what's happening is we are processing this information through perception, inference, and relying on source where you are either an original thinker, questioning everything and then making your own opinions, or you are saying cause to effect and effect to cause, or because that happened, because my parents did this to me, I am like this, because that person did something to me, this happened to my life. But however, as I write right at the beginning, as I said, can you see things? as they are and for what it is instead of creating personal significance. And it is okay to be the victim. It is okay that accidents happen. It is unfortunate, but we are all the victims of our breath. Don't you agree? We are not controlling the breath. Are you not the victim of your breath? Are you not the victim of your heartbeat? So we define victim as a bad word, but actually it's not, isn't it? It's just a word. So there's so many things already happening in our life over which we don't have control and we are okay with it. But when it comes to things that we think similar to us and we are identifying, we are saying that is wrong and I'm at effect. But if you have the ability to accept accidents happen, like how many of you while cooking or in baking something, did you get burnt? Did you have scars of burning on your hands? And that healed, isn't it? But it is that if we don't understand as coaches and healers and therapists, it is what it is. Everything else is personal significance. We are adding to that. What we are doing is we are creating knowledge and memory. We are creating, but creating knowledge and memory, you're also not knowing many things and you're forgetting many things and that leads to thought or that leads to more action. So in this case, if we are taking Dean's experience, he experienced a severe trauma, a complex trauma, and that made him to believe that he's dying. Every time he sees that image, he's dying, he's choking. And he made a meaning out of it that if ever I see that way, this is how I'm going to cope. I'll cry, I'll give up, or I'll be angry. That became his knowledge and it is so inbuilt in the memory. So every time there is a thought, then there is a desire to act in such a way that gave him comfort. And based on that, they can go and choose to act, say or say something, or think in a different way. And that becomes their identity without their knowledge. And the circle repeats. However, you had opportunities to observe at this experiential level, observe at the point where you're making meanings out of it, observe your thoughts and desires, but we fall into the rabbit hole, into the trap, and we don't observe. However, on the other side, we focus on mindfulness and meditation, and we try to suppress the thought and create stillness. Do you think now with the continuous knowledge and memory that is happening and the things that you don't acknowledge and you don't remember, do you ever think you can still the thought? So that's a pursuit that you know it is impossible, isn't it? Where there is knowledge, there is a thought. So the only way what you can do is to separate yourself from the thought and start observing then becoming the thought itself or suppressing the thought. And that's how you will be able to stand back and observe. So you have opportunities either here to observe the thought and not get attached to it or here by the meanings or here with the experiences. 
but we have this opportunity and we still fall into the trap. Now, a person who experienced trauma will go in detail into each of these later into the program. But as a person experiences through this structure, and if you can understand at this, each level, what is happening and how they're forming this identity? What are the core patterns? Because at any, in any given moment, you're experiencing 108 feelings. In any given moment, you're having 108 dimensions to your feeling. So how can you ever pinpoint to one? So if we can understand this structure and if we can understand the structure of the mind, body and energy as together uh, uh, something that we had to understand, then you will be at least able to get a glimpse to keep our filters away and our knowledge away from it. So this is the ego hamster wheel and if we can understand this and there's enough and more to talk about and understand in detail, in depth into this ego hamster wheel. And here, I'm just trying to see here. So this is another testimonial, which is again talking about how quick this process can work. Because it is almost like we are creating a social proof to, again, to spread the possibility of the message that this is possible and you can do it. However, Matt, I discovered this process. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you explain? And I've certainly got a lot of, well, I did have a lot of grief that I was holding on to um, through child abuse. And it was really, it's been really peaceful since I've offloaded that, find it's a bit of a miracle really, because I've been holding on to that most of my life. But I feel quite free compared to where I was before I did the session. It's mostly, um, subconscious grief that you hold on to and you carry around as a burden and it would just impact on your day and stop you from living your life loving your life it stops you from having good relationships every facet of your life comes down to what you're holding within you yourself and i don't think until you start to feel better you don't really realize approximately three hours session each time over three weeks and it was a miracle and that was that it was, it was done and dusted uh, who would have believed that could happen but it did personally i think this from the first session you get some relief and every time i had a session off more and more was being offloaded so even one session was incredible well it's a lot more unstressed and but my anxiety is not a huge issue. I'm sleeping better. Um, but mostly, I think I'm not carrying around that burden, um, which was weighing me down. She is amazing. And to think that in that shorter time, what she achieved for me um, was a lot, probably about 50 counselling sessions or more. Um, so I couldn't thank you enough. There's not a big enough word for it. Feeling where I am now, it's nothing compared to what I've paid all those years in counselling and to the benefits that you get. And I'll carry those benefits and I'll carry it for the rest of my life. And it's a miracle. So that's a program. I wanted to prove something about trauma. And I ran this program saying it's only going to be nine hours. So we catch up three weeks a week and we catch up for three weeks. So three hours a week for three weeks. That's all. And it's almost like a challenge. And I wanted to show that this is possible. And in nine hours, right from where you are, you will be working on it and you'll be resolving it. And we did it with a group of women. And that's the results you can deliver. Now, coming back to emotion and identity, where I'll quickly brush through and we will talk about it. If you're joining on Thursday, I will talk about it shortly. So from these experiences, as you experience through six senses, and then you're making a meaning through your perception, inference, reliance, you're creating feelings. And that feeling at any point of time is having 108 dimensions. 
that 108 dimensions are creating knowledge and memory and that's leading to thought or a desire and based on that you choose to say something do something or think differently and that result gives you the memory of that feeling and that feeling becomes your emotion be it anger be it disgust shame sadness so what happens is most of the times we are so engrossed in this idea that we have to embrace this emotion we have to accept the emotion and emotion is something so sacred but if you can see it for what it is emotion is nothing but a memory of the feeling and if you are constantly feeling that emotion it is time to start questioning and start asking instead of accepting it and again on a big picture in in the big scheme of things nothing really matters but in this given lifetime for today this matters so in the big scheme of things if you don't want to do anything and you just want to keep moving forward we are not going to lose anything don't you agree really nothing is going to happen isn't it but in this given lifetime in this framework if you want to live in the now and if that is bothering you instead of embracing that emotion if we can start understanding where is this stemming from and if you can release it then you will only take 90 seconds to dissipate once you identify it so what is really required is the ability to identify all right so that's how we go into further into identity and then how from here we form values we form our and we manifest manifestation is not a miracle concept because you are a miracle today because you manifested the past you manifested you today whether you know it or not so we go into that identity and for the values and environment how you create how people attract narcissistic partners how people bring in uh, they want relationships but they don't have relationships people they want to do something but they cannot they seem to be doing everything but still nothing materializes because you are the master manifester and it's not beyond your scope of doing things because you today are the manifestation of you yesterday mm-hmm.